So this e-workshop is will be conducted by SSI's uh, sleep expert and also uh, this uh, head nutritionist, Dr. Richard Swinborn from New Zealand. So basically, as coaches, we all know that sleep can make or break an athlete's uh, sporting performance. So how exactly can coaches uh, do, what exactly can coaches do or advise their athletes in order to help their athletes adopt better sleep habits? All right. So at today's e-workshop, you'll find out just in a while. All right. Okay, before we start, just a couple of matters. Um, since late October last year, MCCY has launched this uh, sports resi resilience package to help coaches uh, tie over this um, currently very challenging situation for this uh, COVID-19, all right? So part of this sports resilience package or SRP will be the CCE training allowance with five uh, qualifying criteria as shown in, on the screen, all right? So the first one would be the coach must be a Singapore citizen or permanent resident, PR, attends the CC workshop in full on Zoom only, all right? Submits both post-workshop feedback and the quiz of which he or she will need to store, score at least 80%. Okay, it's, a, it's an MCQ, multiple choice questions, all right? Within 30 minutes after the end of the workshop. And this CC workshop must be above and beyond his or her this uh, annual requirement in terms of CC hours, okay? We'll touch base on this again at the end of the e-workshop, okay? So without further ado, let's, uh, let us welcome Dr. Uh, Richard Swinborn. Rico, now over to you, please. Thank you. There we go. Thanks very much for the introduction. I didn't realize this was the first uh, session, actually. Um, so uh, feel very privileged. Hang on, I'm trying to just. Uh, there we go. Feel very privileged. Very um, excited. I love talking to this group. Um, you know, on this forum, coaches. Uh, you know, so engaged in sports science in general because we know it can provide such an edge, a uh, competitive edge. We're all looking for for that extra. Uh, you know, one or two percent, aren't we? And and what really intrigued me about sleep when I first started getting involved with it is that it's not a a one to two percent it's not a cherry on top it's uh, it's foundational you know it's uh, maybe 50 60 70 percent um kind of a intervention if you like um and so yeah really excited to be presenting um to you today it's it's so true isn't it you know when athletes have a question when they're struggling with something um you know they might be wondering what they should eat uh, to feel better or to recover better. They're pondering, you know, should I start supplementation or not? Um, you know, what about my sleep and my recovery? You know, it's always the good old coach that, uh, you know, it, that, that sees the athlete first and, and the athlete goes and sees the coach, um, you know, much, much earlier than they would ever sit down and talk with a scientist. And so, you know, for that reason alone, you know, it's, it, this is a really important opportunity for me to just have a chat with you and, and perhaps um, you know give you a little bit of knowledge, um, maybe maybe not give you any new knowledge if you've already listened to me before, but rather rather remind or reaffirm you of the importance of sleep and the role of that in your athletes when you're coaching them. Maybe uh, giving you some tools in the toolbox, or maybe just a couple of conversation starters to have with their athletes, because um, you know as uh, as you heard in the really nice uh, introduction, it it can make all the difference. Um, I last presented uh, to um, Coach SG Forum last October, and we talked about learning and skill acquisition and, and the role, the powerful role of sleep for athletes and learning and, uh, you know, learning motor skills, which, of course, coaches are very, very um, invested in and, and want their athletes to develop and learn um, new, new motor skills, new movement patterns, new sport-specific skills as quickly as possible. Uh, and sleep plays a really powerful role in that. And we might talk about that again later in the year. Um, today, I thought I'd just, you know, at the start of the year, um, a lot of you are new to me and to the subject, perhaps we'll just take a step back and be a little more, um, you know, foundational in our approach. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, we're, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about drug Z. I, drug Z, Z, Z. I coined this phrase few years ago now when I first met um, Joseph Schooling I went over to Texas he was still in college over there he was training at Texas University <clears throat> and um, you know sleep science was was brand new to him uh, you know it was kind of brand new to Singapore I suppose 
uh, at an athletic level. And so I went over there, a uh, big, big old trip, and I just started tagging around with him. <clears throat> I had a sleep watch on his wrist. Um, you know, I was looking at his uh, sleep environment, um, just getting to know him. And as, as coach, um, like, a, like, a, like a Yoda of coaching, really, uh, Eddie Reese. He's about 70. Uh, he must be mid-70s now, Eddie. Um, you know, I don't know, easily top, easily top three coaches in the world, one of the most successful swimming coaches ever. And just before practice, he pulled me aside and he said, hey, I want you to go into the changing sheds. Uh, and I just, all the, all the boys are, are really curious about what you were doing here with Joseph. Like they see the thing on his watch, uh, the watch on his wrist and they see you like shadowing him and they, they want to know what you're doing. And I was like, okay. So I went into the changing room and there's like half a dozen Olympians in there. Actually, it's probably more than that. They're all sitting in there in their uh, swim swimsuits and getting ready for practice. And um, in some ways, I didn't quite know what to say, but I, I just sort of said, um, well, I'm, I've flown all the way from Singapore to start Joseph on a performance enhancing drug. And of course, you know, the Olympians, like, the, you know, their eyes fell out of their head because they know that's not allowed. Of course, it's not allowed. But, uh, but you know, I was like, no, this drug, I'm very, very comfortable with it. It's freely available on the market. Um, you can overdose on it. And in fact, I'm getting, uh, I'm encouraging Joseph to overdose on it. It has amazing side effects. You recover from training really quickly. It has a, a performance enhancing properties and you just feel really happy on this stuff. Like, you know, it's like, uh, like it's an antidepressant really. Like you just can't help but smiling when you've had a good sleep. And, um, and, and they really didn't know what I was talking about. And then I said, you know, I call it drug Z, drug Z, 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 uh, and I'm talking about sleep. And then the penny dropped and, and that's where uh, that idea came from for me. So um, it's very natural, it's safe, and it's perform and performance enhancing for sure. And it's not just Joseph Schooling that's cottoned on to this. Um, you know, over the last few years, we've seen a really a real emergence in sleep science and people like me working with, you know, the world's best athletes um, who are hunting for the performance competitive edge really aggressively. Um, you know, Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, um, you know, sleeping like nine, 10, up to 12 hours a day. Uh, Usain Bolt, you know, eight to 10 hour sleeper would regularly nap in the afternoon before breaking world records. Um, it's well integrated into uh, premiership football now. Um, Manchester City built uh, a, a brand new athlete hotel uh, at their training facility so the athletes could have a really good night's sleep uh, pre-game and they were just trying to control that sleep aspect. Um, Seattle Seahawks as well, uh, quite prominent um, Super Bowl winners a few years ago and they were using they were plugged in very deeply into sleep and, and monitoring all their athletes very thoroughly putting them into one or two buckets either you're a good sleeper or you're not a good sleeper the good sleepers okay carry on the the poor sleepers okay you, you come and spend a little bit of time with with someone a little bit like me um and uh, you know learn how to improve that because it will improve your game and so really uh, you know we, what we're trying to do is bust, bust some myths um Historically, people have been trying to understand sleep and we've really thought of sleep as uh, being a bit of a waste of time. Like, you know, the body's inert, like it's still, it's unconscious, there's nothing happening in there. It's kind of a waste of time. You should be awake trying to do something, trying to study, trying to learn, trying to practice, trying to trying to um, get fitter. Um, and, and actually, we know now that, uh, that what, what sleep is is a, is a highly active brain inside a very inactive body. And of course, when the body is inactive, it's resting and it's recuperating and all of that happens. And of course, when the brain is active, it is, uh, it is firing le learning neurons. It is um, in uh, integrating and storing away memories. It is learning. And we know that, um, that all of this happens uh, during sleep. And the more sleep you get, the more it happens. And this is, this is really the first take home for you. Um, hint, hint, this might be in the quiz. Um, aiming for 10, hitting nine, and definitely beating eight hours a night uh, is a great target. Now, if we just step back and look at sleep at a local level, average sleep time in Singapore, six and a half hours, that's the average. That means some people are getting more, but a lot of people are getting less. And we know that um, our, our athlete cohort in Singapore are, um, are a little bit less than that, around uh, six and a quarter, six and a half hours 
um, and very, very sleepy. Uh, about two and three athletes are clinically sleepy in the day, meaning they don't get enough sleep. And so a great question just to ask your athlete is, um, you know, how do you feel today? How, how was your sleep last night? What time did you get to sleep? Not what time did you go to bed because athletes lie in bed and play on their phones. Uh, what time did you go to sleep? What time did you wake up? Um, and could you go back to sleep before lunchtime? Generally, if somebody can go back to sleep in the morning before lunchtime, they haven't had enough sleep. It's a great question to ask. The benefits of sleep, um, you know, science has been unraveling this for, for, um, for the last probably 50, 60 years now. We know that there's a really big physical regenerative um, component to why we sleep. You know, scientists have always asked why we sleep. And, and uh, one of the theories is this physical regeneration. Um, at night, we release growth hormone. We, we release bucket loads of growth hormone, and that drives muscle protein synthesis. It's at its highest um, at night. Um, it drives bone growth as well. 90% of our bone growth occurs while we sleep. So you think about our young athletes who are developing swimmers desperately want long limbs. Um, you know, it pays for them to spend a little bit more time in bed. And of course, we see in you know, a joint healing as well, cartilage and, and, and tendons. Um, and uh, as you'll see a little bit later on, there is a, a relationship to injury as well. So, um, and also testosterone. So, you know, early, early part of the night, we release growth hormone. Later part of the night, we release testosterone. And that's a really powerful recovery and performance hormone, not only for men, but also for women. Um, and then, of course, we jump to the brain from the body to the brain. And, you know, a lot of different things happen in the brain and we go through different sleep stages. And one of the last sleep, st um, le last sleep stages that we go through um, is, uh, is dream sleep or REM sleep. We call it REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep because the body is actually completely paralyzed in this state and all that moves is your diaphragm to keep air ventilating uh, and, and keep your lungs going um, and your eyes move around behind your eyelids and you might have seen that in horror movies or you might have seen somebody sleeping and you can see their eyes moving behind their closed eyelids so um, of course that's a protective mechanism it's not in our best interest to act out our dreams particularly if we're dreaming about parachuting or um, or something like that uh, so it's, it's protective for us. Um, but you know, the brain is, is more alive actually during deep, uh, um, during REM sleep than it is during the day. And some parts of the brain are actually 30% more active. And we know now that this is where we develop emotional intelligence, um, in terms of being able to regulate our emotions. If you think about your athletes, who are trying to cope with anxiety and stress and pressure, um, and trying to keep cool under pressure. Um, cognitive intelligence as well, creativity. Um, a lot of problems have been solved in sleep and a lot of things have been created in sleep. Um, if you're a fan of the Beatles and you know the song Yesterday, I won't sing it for you, but um, um, Paul McCartney actually dreamed that song in his sleep. He woke up and he had the tune in his head. He got immediately out of bed. He walked over to his piano and his fingers just rolled out this tune that he'd never even thought of before. And that's how that was born. Um, the periodic table was also put together as well. And if you know how complicated, extraordinarily complicated that is, mapping out all the elements in the universe that we know and putting it into a table, that was put together uh, during dream sleep as well. Um, and so a lot of complex problem solving having, happening while we dream, quite amazing. This is what, uh, this is what a, a sleep stage and a series of sleep stages looks like. This is a, a, a hypnogram and... Um, you know, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we close our eyes, we're unconscious. We don't really know what's happening in our sleep. I thought I'd just quickly describe some of the sleep stages for you so you can get a, a feel for that. Um, I'm just going to start at this end of things because I've talked about um, physical regeneration and most of that happens during deep sleep at the start of the night. Uh, and I've talked about dream sleep, but light sleep is really important. We spend 50% of our night in light sleep. And this is where most of our motor skill learning occurs. Um, and the really interesting point for you to take home is that the great majority of motor skill learning for your athletes happens between hour six and hour eight of an eight hour sleep. So, you know, if your athletes are getting five to six hours sleep, they, they, they're really not getting a whole bunch opportunity to practice the skills that you've taught them during the day. Something to think about. 
physical uh, regeneration and, and uh, academic learning as well occurs in deep sleep. It's in deep sleep that we actually transfer memories from our short term memory storage, our USB, if you like, in a hippocampus, and that moves to our neocortex where it's locked away in a vault, and we can we can um, we can access it, but um, but also you know we we don't lose it very readily. It's in the filing cabinet under lock and key. Um, if we don't get enough deep sleep or if we don't um, sleep at all, uh, we, we, we lose that ability to transfer memories or, and we lose that ability to actually store new memories um, in, in our short-term storage facility in our USB. So um, some profound um, uh, consequences for academic learning, if you think about your, stu your, uh, your athletes who are students, no doubt, um, you know, learning all day at school and then, you know, they go home and then they try and, uh, you know, they try and learn again, maybe having a nap between those two learning blocks, really important. And then we have that dream sleep. And, and another interesting fact for you is that 60 to 90% of our dreams occur between hours eight, uh, between hours six and eight of sleep as well. So again, um, if your athletes are getting five to six hours sleep a night, they could be missing out on up to 90% of their dream sleep and all of those wonderful benefits that I just described that comes from that in terms of developing emotional health, psychological health, um, and, uh, and, you know, cognitive, um, cognitive ability as well, problem solving and all of these wonderful things. If we just pull back and look at sleep at a local level, I've worked with a lot of athletes here around sleep and, and one young man um, that, uh, that really struggled with his sleep um, in the early days was Darren Chua, who is of course, um, you know, an Asian Games medalist, um, Sea Games uh, gold medalist. Um, he's in the Olympic pipeline, and, and I'm sure we'll see him on the big stage, uh, you know, come the time. And this is his quote, sleep is where all the good stuff happens. It's where I truly get to recover. But for DC, it wasn't always that way. He really struggled with sleep. And I was first introduced to him as a 17-year-old. The coaches pulled me aside and they said, um, you know, we've got this young man and he's really not backing up trainings. He struggles to, he struggles to come back after a hard training. His wheels are kind of spinning in the water. We're really not seeing any growth and development out of him. Um, you know, we like, he's feeling tired all the time, you know, what's going on. Um, and you know, chronically under recovered failure to thrive. He hadn't grown in over 12 months, which is really quite alarming for a 17 year old boy when they're full of testosterone and growth hormone and they, you know, meant to be growing like mushrooms. And, uh, you know, upon investigation and just asking a few questions, he was not sleeping very well. What that looked like, we had to dive a little bit deeper. We put a sleep watch on his wrist and you can see just some of the data that we found, um, on DC. Um, and, uh, you know, a sleep watch is basically just um, an accelerometer. Okay, so it registers movement. You can see all the spikes there through the day. So in the middle of each um, line, you know, there's a lot of spikes. That's DC moving around. And then at night, you would hope not to see many spikes. So you can see the gray bars on the left um, and a few on the right. So that's his night. That's his sleeping block. And ideally, it should be solid gray. It should be a solid gray bar. But rather, it looks like... Um, like a information, uh, like a barcode, doesn't it, on the back of a loaf of bread or something? Um, if you know what uh, I mean. Rico? Yeah. Rico, yeah. Uh, just to sorry, just to interrupt. Uh. Yeah. Mm. So, would you be presenting your slides in a while? Can you not see them? Uh, no, I didn't see any slides. Yeah, I mean, some coaches are asking actually. Oh, I've, okay. I've had heaps of slides. Oh, I didn't realize. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Rico. Uh, wait, wait. Can you see them now? Uh, not yet. No. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought you could see them all. You can see that now. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Just go to uh, this uh, full screen. You see that now? Oh uh, yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, there's our drug Z. These are all our uh, athletes that I described that are embracing sleep, the miracles and the magic. I want you to take that home. Aim, for, aim for ten, hit nine, beat eight hours a night. Our physical regeneration. Our, um, our emotional intelligence, cognitive intelligence, creativity, the brain very active in sleep. I talked you through um, what a, a night looks like with a hypnogram. Okay, so light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep, and the need for your athletes really to clock up a lot of time between hours six and eight. 
right? Otherwise, they're missing out on a lot of light sleep, a lot of motor skill learning, and a lot of dream sleep, um, and a lot of uh, emotional and psychological health and the benefits that come from that. There's my young man, DC, and there's this quote, sleep is where all the good stuff happens. It's where I truly get to recover. And of course, uh, the picture that I was presented when I first saw him um, from the coaches, and, uh, and, and that's uh, what his night looked like. So you can see on the left-hand side, that solid gray bar, it's really, really broken. So, um, you know, if you look in the middle and you can see the, the total sleep times, you know, four hours, 45, four hours, 15, five hours, 10, this is a guy that was training, you know, like five hours a day, 17 year old going to school, meant to be growing, um, simply not enough. And, uh, and hence he wasn't performing in the pool uh, and he wasn't performing outside of the pool and, and actually he was getting very sick and unwell. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately for DC, we picked that up and we sent him for um, some follow-up investigations and an overnight sleep test. Uh, and we got him some treatment and actually he had to go out and have surgery. He had a whole lot of, um, He'd have a whole lot of musculature stripped out of his nose because it was blocking his sleep. He was actually strangling himself about 21 times a night. His blood oxygen levels were dropping. And of course, his brain was getting into this crisis state and waking him up all the time. That's what was happening. Um, DC is really my, um, my poster boy for sleep. And I've got his permission, of course, to talk about him and share his story. Um, and we got him to a point where he started flying. And here he is literally flying at, um, at Asian Games. Jakarta 2018, uh, anchoring the 4x100 men's and, and bringing home a, a medal for Singapore. So a really nice story. So I guess what's happening for, for DC and what's happening for your athletes when they get more sleep is they, they really increase their, their coping threshold, their resilience to stress. Right, and we know that that resilience to stress creates a robust athlete, robust against injury, robust against illness, and I'll share a little bit of data on that soon. Um, and uh, and of course, it really is foundational for their mental health and their and their physical wellness. At the end of the day, it's a little bit like a sponge. And um, Usain Bolt actually talked about sleep as being like a sponge. He said it helped him absorb the training that he was, um, you know, undertaking. He could kind of soak up the training and. And I guess that's what sleep does. It helps helps people soak up stress. We know that we're much more resilient to, to any type of stress. And of course, um, physical training um, and athletic development, like it's a stress on the body. And then when the body senses a stress, um, all of these wonderful mechanisms and signals, um, chemicals are, uh, are released in the body to enable um, adaptation. And that adaptation happens while we sleep. Basically, it, it allows the, the, uh, the coach to apply more stress to the athlete, you really want to be able to apply as much stress as you can to the athlete, the athletes that can take the most punishment uh, and adapt to that, um, you know, uh, head into a, a greater performance. So, um, so that's kind of how sleep is working for our athletes. A lot of uh, research coming out now around injury and sleep. And we know that when athletes don't sleep enough they are at a higher risk of injury and of course there's lots of different variables at play here but one of them that really makes sense to me is the fact that the brain the central nervous nervous system it it controls where the arm and legs go it controls reaction times it con controls proprioception it controls all the, the fine muscles um, that are involved in balance and and you know it can be the difference between you know that that foot going left an inch or right an inch or that knee um, you know, going in and out by half a centimetre. Um, a lot of studies in youth as well and finding that youth who get less than eight hours a night, which would realistically be the great majority of our youth in Singapore, have almost um, twice the risk of injury um, through their sport as those that are getting more than eight hours. And as we know, that's, that's fundamental for an athlete. If an athlete's injured, they're not playing um, and they're not developing. And similarly for, um, for the immune system as well. And of course, you know, since uh, COVID erupted, um, you know, immunity and immune strength has been on everybody's minds. And, uh, and, you know, there's been some interesting stuff around sleep and immune strength um, in the past. This was a really interesting study whereby they squirted an influenza virus up subjects' noses. They actually volunteered for this and then they locked them in a hotel and they sat back and watched them and they looked at total sleep times versus how many people got sick. 
and there was a very clear relationship. People that slept less than five hours a night were uh, four and a half times more likely to convert that flu exposure into a fully blown flu. Whereas the people that got more sleep, um, you know, were more more resilient, more robust, uh, were stronger against that virus. Their bodies were able to fight that virus and stop it from multiplying. And of course, when we sleep, we have these wonderful cells co called um, killer T cells. They're like Navy SEALs, basically. They have the night vision goggles on, they have the rifles, and they're stalking around the body looking for the bad guys. And of course, you know, when you, uh, when you get more sleep, you know, you get more Navy SEALs um, patrolling around your body looking for the viruses and the colds and the, and the pathogens. So sleep plays a really important role. And again, if your athletes are, um, are sick, then they're not able to train and they're certainly not able to perform to their, to their fullest potential. So illness and injury, two very, very universally relevant um, issues for athletes and actually really modifiable uh, through getting more replete sleep. Athletes struggle with sleep for, um, for a whole bunch of reasons, to be honest. Um, I see the first one there is long haul travel, which, um, you know, used to be an issue. It's not so much anymore. And I'm sure it will become again in the future. But if you think about trans meridian flight and, uh, you know, the speed at which jets fly now, uh, and time zone changes over a very short time and, and jet lag, and travel fatigue as well. It's not just jet lag, it's travel fatigue, um, you know, getting dehydrated, uh, you know, being up for long periods of time. It's very draining. Um, but, you know, athletes are asked to train early in the morning. They're asked to train late at night. Think about your own training times and are you able to manipulate that? We know that when we can manipulate that a little bit and rest the athlete a little bit more and give them more opportunity to sleep, good things happen. Um, athletes get very anxious, don't they? They get very worked up around competition, but not only competition, also around hard training. You know, athletes have to push it to the edge and they have to, you know, they have to live in the in the pain locker, don't they? So, um, you know, uh, that's not always easy to do. And I'll share a little study with you soon, um, which showed that athletes could actually push through pain much more readily, um, you know, with a little bit more sleep. Um, I've suggested to you that sleep's really important and I've said that we don't actually get a whole lot here in Singapore. Of course, you know, we think about this term periodization, you periodize um, your athlete's training, you know what I'm talking about there. Um, we can periodize carbohydrate, you know, with a high training load, you know, we can bump the carbohydrates up, can't we, and, and fill the fuel tank in the body. And we can also think about sleep in the same way and periodize sleep. And while I might be, you know, encouraging my athletes to sleep more, sometimes they just can't. They have exams, they have life stuff going on. Sometimes we just don't get a lot. Um, but there are critical times, you know, such as before a competition where an athlete might actually need to get more sleep. And we can ask the question, can we bank it? Can we save it before competition? The answer is most certainly yes. And this was, um, there's been a few studies like this. This was one particular study um, by Arnold um, and colleagues back in 2016. And they took a, a bunch of people, um, split them into two groups. One group um, had uh, six nights of habitual sleep, which was around about, it was still a lot of sleep, around eight and a quarter hours of sleep. And then on the right, they had a group who got more sleep than normal, um, you know, almost uh, a little more than an hour and a half of extra sleep. So considering a sleep cycle is around 90 minutes, they, they just got another sleep cycle. They got more time in uh, REM sleep. They got more time in light sleep, okay? And then after six nights of those sleeping conditions, they, they kept them up all night. They sleep deprived them, made them tired. And then they put them through an exercise uh, test of time to exhaustion. And, and that rating of perceived exertion, how hard that session felt, um, it was much lower in the group that, that went into that session with more sleep. Um, and so we know that, you know, getting more sleep actually, um, again, it makes the athlete more robust and more resilient to pain and discomfort, and they're able to push a little bit more too. So that idea of sleep um, increasing intrinsic internal motivation to push and to drive, um, that seems to uh, increase in, um, during submaximal efforts. Um, so a, a really nice finding, banking sleep. Um, in terms of athletic performance, uh, we've done studies like this with swimming and, and basketball, American football, tennis as well, uh, and my own studies in rugby. 
And, and they've all found that when we extend an athlete's sleep for a few weeks, um, we see improvements, sport-specific improvements for that athlete. This particular study was been swimmers and collegiate level swimmers. Um, and you can see there, you know, they started sprinting faster. They started reacting faster off the block at the start. Their turn time efficiency was, uh, was improved. And their kick strokes, the amount of work they got through in the pool was, was higher as well. So again, that echoes the last study that I just described. And this is a really important one for swimming because, you know, at the elite level, most swimmers are about the same speed between the walls. In the water, they're about the same speed. Um, and where, it, where it's won and lost is on the start and on the turn. And turning time efficiency, you know, time to target on the wall, turning your body, positioning it correctly, getting streamlined and then pushing off um, concentrically, um, you know, really hard. Um, like that's actually quite complex and the brain has to do a lot of thinking and of course as you've heard sleep has a really important role for the brain the more effective and efficient the brain is working the more efficient uh, and effective that turn time is as well and then we can think about recovery and this is just an example of a study that um, that basically thrashed a bunch of athletes um, the control group had eight hours in bed the extended group got 10 hours in bed. 10 seems to be the magic number. It's the magic number that I used as well in my own sleep extension study. Um, most people can't quite get to 10 hours, but if you give them the opportunity, they'll go pretty close. And then they had a napping group. So they got eight hours overnight and then they encouraged them to have a two hour nap in the afternoon. This is a really relevant one for Singapore because most of our athletes can't get enough sleep overnight. Um, and if they have an opportunity for a nap in the afternoon, it can be really, really good for them. The important point to note is that it needs to be a part of their habitual routine. Um, an interesting study at the Singapore Sports School found with shooters and sprinters that if you get um, a young athlete to nap ad hoc when they're not usually used to napping, um, actually the opposite occurs. Their brain is still really sleepy when they're trying to perform and they run slower and they, and they shoot poorer. So, um, so encouraging that habitual napping, um, quite a nice uh, initiative. The one caveat to that would be if somebody has a really bad insomnia, they can't get to sleep at night, it's better not to nap. It's better to be a little more tired. So when your head hits the pillow, you've got a little more sleep pressure and you can get to sleep a little bit faster. But this study interestingly found that the, the group that extended their sleep 10 hour block overnight or um, inserted a nap uh, in the afternoon, um, yes, their sleep times went up, their return uh, to full muscle function was a little bit faster and uh, then the group that had eight hours in bed, um, their return to full sprint performance was faster and they felt, um, you know, psychological stress a little less. So again, there's reinforcing if I think that I've spoken to already. And then, you know, not only the physical, but the, the mental athlete as well, you know, the brain first athlete. And we've got lots of examples of that in Singapore, haven't we? You know, with, um, with bowling, uh, with shooting, with archery, you know, um, athletes that that uh, they need a lot of hand-eye coordination, a lot of concentration as well. You know, the 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 performance of their central nervous system is really really important. And as you've heard earlier, the central nervous system gets really active at night. Um, it's you know it's really using that sleep to um, to to grow and develop uh, and to improve. And so we took a, um, a large uh, bunch of developmental bowlers, um, you know, still elite bowlers uh, preparing for SEA Games um, at, uh, through, um, through bowling here in Singapore. I think we had about 28. The youngest was maybe around 14 or 15 and the oldest was maybe 22. Um, and um, prior to a control phase where they were just getting a normal amount of sleep and that was somewhere between about kind of five and six and a half hours a night for most of them. Um, it was exam time as well. Um, and, you know, that's just part of life here. So, you know, that was okay. Um, we, we monitored um, some different variables um, in and around their stress um, and how well they were sleeping and how they were feeling. And we also got them to play um, three games of, uh, of bowls with an oiling pattern that was going to be used in the Singapore Champs. And then we gave them about 10 days of extended sleep. So not quite two weeks, but a little more than a week where we then encourage, they had to hit their school holidays uh, and we gave them an opportunity to, to sleep in and to sleep more. And some of them actually slept like two hours more than they normally got. And then we gave them another game, three games of bowling. And 
And we worked out with some statistical analysis, the effect size or the effect, uh, the magnitude of the effect of getting more sleep on their game. And we looked at seven different um, aspects of, uh, of their game uh, and, this, and their scoring. So their strike percentage, you know, how many pins fell down, their average score per game, um, you know, their first ball average, um, their makeable spare percentage, um, all, spore, all spare percentage, nine spare percentage. Um, you know, if you're into bowling, you'll know what all of that means. But you, basically, you can see the magnitude of, of, um, of sleep impact on that, on that scoring variable, right? And you can see, actually, you know, a lot of them are small. Some of them are trivial. Um, small doesn't necessarily mean insignificant, though. And when you look at, um, you know, you look back at the Philippines last year, 2019 world champs, only two points separated a medal winner from a non-medalist in both the men's and the women's singles finals, right? Only two points. Um, and, uh, and our average um, point improvement per game was seven. Um, and so, you know, a small magnitude, but um, actually small is not insignificant when you consider that, you know, that's five more than what was required to put somebody on the podium um, at, at, world, sorry, at World Champs last year. And then at SEA Games, um, five points um, separated a podium finisher and a non-podium finisher in the men's single. So again, on average, um, you know, uh, score per game increased by seven points in this study. So, you know, actually quite significant. Um, I would suggest um, a strong perf uh, competitive edge available to our bowlers as brain first athletes. If they just simply bank a little bit of sleep, um, store it up going into competition, dissolve the sleep debt that they might be carrying around, periodize that like they might their training, like they might periodize uh, their food as well. And it can have um, you know really positive impact on their game. Um, just, um, just a little note on, on actually how to improve sleep. We've talked a lot about the value of sleep for athletes and you know what it can do for their bodies and their brains and their, and their games as well. In Singapore, it's a, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? It's a big city. It's very light. It's very noisy. It's very bright. It's very fast. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure on our young athletes. Um, and I just want to comment on a couple of variables that, that you can talk about with your athletes to help improve their sleep. One would be to block out light. Ideally, we want um, the sleep environment to be as dark as possible. Um, ideally, you shouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. And of course, if you're wearing a sleep mask, you can't see your hand. It's very, very dark. This is the sleep mask um, that, that I bought and, uh, and, and wear in Singapore. Um, a sleep master. They don't pay me or anything like that, but I just bought it on Amazon. It was about $49, $50. Um, and it's really comfortable. I use it on the airplanes as well, or I used to. Uh, and when I'm traveling and when I'm in um, camps and things like this, I'm very comfortable. The eyelids are transparent and the eyes are actually part of the brain and they're the only part of the brain that sits outside of the skull. And of course, the eye's job is to sense light uh, and it's very, very good at that. And of course, when we see light, um, the brain thinks, okay, we're meant to be awake. And when we see dark, the brain thinks, okay, we're meant to be asleep and we make melatonin when the light levels go down at night. So I'm um, encouraging athletes to, to get blackout curtains, maybe to wear a sleep mask. It can make a huge difference to their sleep. And this is just one example of a swimmer that I worked with, um, a, a um, different, not DC, another young chap, um, had uh, a really bad sleep quality. You can see here three out of 10 on the sleep watch that we were working, um, working with at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, upon questioning, his, his room was really quite bright. And so I just got him to wear a sleep, uh, no, not a sleep mask, actually he changed his curtains. He got some blackout curtains. Um, and then the next night, um, you can see the improvement in his sleep quality from a really broken sleep block to a really nice solid one. Uh, you know, woke up mid-morning to go to the bathroom or something, but that's about it. Um, you know, one awakening versus nine. Felt amazing and texted me about four times the next day. He just couldn't believe the impact that making his bedroom dark could have on his sleep quality, which, you know, for him was gold. A nice analogy to use with your athletes is to, um, you know, create like a camp at, at home. So when the sun goes down, you know, we're very primal. We're kind of like cavemen still. When the sun goes down, um, our eye detects that drop in light intensity. We make melatonin and a, and a couple of hours later, we get very sleepy. 
and that encourages us to go to bed. So, you know, when people go camping, the sun goes down and typically, and we've studied people, we've put them in the Grand Canyon and all of these sorts of things in camping situations. And when the sun goes down, the ambient light level drops, people get sleepy maybe two hours before they normally would at home. They might light a fire, they might light a lamp. And that's really good advice for people at home. Don't keep the overhead lights on. Don't keep the room really bright because that's suppressing melatonin secretion from the pineal gland in the brain. And it's preventing people from going to sleep. But if you let your house just go naturally dark, put a lamp on, put the night mode on your phone, on your computer, um, it has a really big impact on your sleep hormones um, and your, your ability to go to sleep and your sleep quality throughout the night. The other thing that typically happens when we go camping is that we get a little cold. Um, you know, we don't, we're not inside and, uh, you know, you might be in a snuggly sleeping bag or something, but generally the body will sleep much better in a cold environment than it will a hot environment. And so encouraging your athletes to use their AC uh, and to find a temperature sweet spot somewhere between 20 and 22 works pretty well in Singapore. Scientists have actually discovered that 18 degrees Celsius is the ideal temperature um, to encourage optimized sleep. For us in Singapore, that's probably a little bit too cold. Um, when I used to live in New Zealand, that was uh, that was bang on. <laughs> but I'm um, I'm maladapted now. I'm very Singaporean in that sense. Um, I struggle with the cold. So 2022 is is just nice. You want a nice warm body and a nice cool head. We lose most of our body heat through our head. So um, so that's that's nice advice. So we're controlling uh, light and we're controlling temperature. Um, and we're encouraging a, a regular sleep wake rhythm. And if we can really get on top of those three things, you know, that's, that's a large, um, a large part of solving our sleep problems in this country. You can take a screenshot of this. Now that you can see my screen. You can take a screenshot of this um, 10 tips for better sleep from the world sleep society. And what it's describing is sleep hygiene really. Um, if you're a parent and you've had a child, you really have a PhD in sleep hygiene already because, you know, when babies are born, the parent wants that baby to get to sleep and stay asleep as quickly as possible. Um, you know, so the parent can have a little bit of time to themselves and, uh, you know, nobody likes a, a crying, screaming baby. So, um, you know, what happens is that our parents and our grandparents, um, you know, and, and sometimes our nannies, you know, they teach us. Um, how to put that baby to sleep, right? We give them a meal, we give them some milk, they're getting a little bit of tryptophan, which increases melatonin secretion in the brain. Um, you know, we're dropping the light levels, uh, we're singing them a song, we, um, we give them a bath, don't we? And so they're a little bit of skin warming there. And when you get out of warm water, you get cold. So there's that camping effect. Um, and so that encourages, um, it's a biological signal uh, to tell the brain that it's time to go to sleep. And we're very routine and regular about it, aren't we? We try and establish a regular bedtime for the baby. Um, we say good night to the giraffe and the hippopotamus each night, and we do that in the same order each night. If you mess that up, you know, look out. Um, we don't put an iPhone in their face, ideally. We, uh, we, we make the, the room nice and dim. We make sure they're warm and comfortable. Uh, we might, you know, pat them on the back or give them a massage or sing them a song, so some relaxation. And we can replicate that these days easily with all of the apps that are out there, headspace, meditation, mindfulness, some music, you know, some light reading, some, you know, whatever it takes. Um, and then eventually the baby gets so used to this routine that it falls asleep before it even gets to the end of it. Uh, so this is exactly what sleep hygiene is. It works very well for babies and it works very well for big humans as well. So that's another nice analogy. We've heard the camping analogy. We've heard the, um, the uh, getting the baby to sleep analogy. Um, I think that will stick with you now and you'll be able to kind of tell those stories back to your athletes. Works very well. People can visualize that really effectively. And so um, really this is about what all I wanted to talk to you about and it's about where to next, I think. How do you take this information and how do you apply it to your athletes? What kind of questions can you start asking them? Um, you know, when do they sleep? When do they wake? How many hours did they get? They can work that out and you can work that out. Are they sitting on five or six? Are they missing out on 90% of their dream sleep? Are they missing out on, you know, 80 plus percent, 80 over percent of their, um, of their, um, you know, motor control opportunity, motor, motor learning opportunity uh, and light sleep? 
Are they getting all that physical regeneration that they need so they can front up for you in training the next day? Um, could they actually go back to bed before lunchtime? Awesome question to ask. If yes, they're deprived, they're not getting enough sleep, they're under huge sleep debt. Um, and your program is actually compromised. Your job is to get them the most out of your athletes as you can. And just getting a little bit more sleep can really enable that. And, and lastly, I would just suggest just, you know, that, that idea of having a conversation with them. Just talk with them. Don't tell them. Don't take that kind of parent to child, um, you know, like get to bed early, get off your phone, you know, get more sleep. Um, you know, actually have that generative conversation about solutions and maybe reflecting on some of the analogies and some of the studies and some of the information that you've heard in this talk. Um, hopefully you can take that forward into some of those conversations with your athletes. Um, it's really important to remember that everybody sleeps differently. It's very, very individual. Um, most humans need between seven and a half and eight and a half hours of sleep. We encourage athletes probably get more like eight to nine, hint, hint for the exam. Um, you know, and that makes sense, doesn't it? When you look at how the body rests and recovers and rebuilds and repairs and improves and adapts and sleep, it makes sense that, you know, our athletes are under more stress than the average human being. They need more sleep to kind of get over that stress, to become resilient to that stress, to adapt to that stress and to kind of take it forward into becoming fitter, faster, stronger and more powerful um, so that, you know, come race day, you know, they can bring that competitive edge and that, and that, uh, that strong performance that sleep can enable. So thanks very much. Um, apologies for the absence of slides at the start. Love talking to myself there. <laughs> but hopefully you took... Uh, well, hopefully you took a little something out of that talk and um, you know, I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Um, and I think, um, I think there's a couple of more slides as well uh, from, um, from the other end as well. So yeah, over to you uh, there in the control tower, my friend, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thanks Rico once again for another insightful presentation on sleep. Okay. So now uh, coaches, the floor is yours. Uh, we have about a uh, few minutes few minutes or so. So if you have any burning questions about sleep, please unmute your mic and then just ask away. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoy getting questions. Um, I mean, it's kind of affirmation for me that people listen, I suppose, but, um, you know, it's a great opportunity just to ask something that might be on your mind because as I say, sleep is just so individual. If we went around the room and asked everybody about their sleep, which we're not going to do, but if we did, you know, we'd, we'd definitely get a different story from everybody in terms of how much they need, what they need to feel good, um, you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. Um, so yeah, really, really happy to, to entertain any questions um, and chat about that if there's a, anything that you'd like to know. I can't see the, uh, where's the um, chat box as well? Is there anything in there? Okay, I, okay. I just found this yeah. chat box here. Yeah. Yes, there's uh, some questions coming in. First question is Kobe Bryant splits his, yeah. splits his sleep duration in different sessions and he can still perform during competition. Okay, don't know much about that. I mean, this idea of um, biphasic sleep, uh, it got really popular a few years ago. People, um, actually, um, back in the... Uh, Back in the, when was it, in the 1600s, uh, somewhere around there, it was quite fashionable for humans to kind of sleep in two sleep blocks or to split the night up into two blocks. Um, and, um, you know, when we look at all the scientific evidence, there's actually no scientific rationale for that. It was probably more a societal trend. Um, you know, people got up and they, uh, they ate and drank and, and did little things. Um, and then they went back to bed. But, you know, all the evidence points to the benefits of a solid overnight sleep and then topping up with a little nap, that definitely seems to be uh, the best way to go about it. So, um, so yeah, I, if it worked for Kobe Bryant, uh, that's fantastic. But it's uh, it's certainly not um, it's certainly not recommended. Yeah, would they feel even more tired after a nap? Yeah, that really depends on when you wake up, what part of your sleep stage um, you wake up. So, for the first twenty minutes, you spend time in light sleep. 
you know, when people just starting to drift off and, you know, they might twitch a little bit, um, you know, if you shook their shoulder, they would wake up. They're not under too much anesthetic there. They're not under too much gas. They're not too knocked out. They're quite light. So if you set your alarm for around about 20 to 30 minutes, you'll wake up in light sleep and you'll feel very alert. You'll feel very, very good. Indeed, Einstein used to sleep for a couple of minutes. He would sit in a chair with a spoon uh, in his hand. And of course, when he fell asleep, he, like it would just go all limp and he'd drop the spoon and it would make a noise on the ground and that would wake him up. And so you yeah, just a little wee dip, just a couple of minute dip into light sleep. Um, and even that can be very, very um, regenerative for the brain. It's a little bit like, if I use the analogy of a cell phone, like if you want to make a call on your phone and it's flat, what do you do? Well, you find a phone charger or you find a wall and a cord and a power cord and you plug it in for a couple of minutes and it just boosts the battery. You know, the brain is a battery, isn't it? So um, yeah, it works the same. Um, it works the same as that. Um, if you wake up at around 60 minutes, you'll be right down deep and deep and in, uh, in deep sleep. You're really, really unconscious. Um, you know, a, a, a lightning bolt could come through your roof and you probably wouldn't wake up. Um, and if you wo if you did wake up, and if your alarm went off um, in the middle of deep sleep, you'll wake up very groggy. It's called sleep inertia um, or sleep disorientation. Um, NASA did a lot of studies on this because they wanted to know if an astronaut was flying the space shuttle and something went wrong and they were asleep, um, you know, can they wake up and actually fly the shuttle um, and, and um you know, and kind of save the whole thing um, or will they still be drowsy? And they found that about 26 minutes was perfect. The other option is to go a full sleep cycle, which is 90 minutes. And that might be a better option if, if you're under a really high training load, if you're really sleep deprived, if you don't have any problems getting to sleep at night. So the rule of thumb is 30 minutes or 90 minutes um, and, and try not to, to wake up in between. Otherwise you can feel really tired. Taxi drivers, for example, shouldn't get behind the wheel for 30 minutes after they wake up from a nap because the brain's still not firing at 100%. Um, oh, I've got lots of questions here. Uh, if, uh, just curious, if it's more than 10 hours sleep, any more gains or similar to nine hours? Um, you know, sleep, sleep dose studies have found that when people enter sleep studies and they give them an opportunity to sleep as much as they want, they can bite off like 14 hours of sleep for a couple of nights. They're just trying to dissolve that sleep debt um, that we accrue. The brain is like an accountant. And so if, you if you're a person that needs eight hours sleep a night and you normally get six, um, you know, that's like you're missing 12 hours of sleep. Uh, that's more than a whole night by the end of the week. And so, you know, you feel that fatigue and that tiredness. So when people have an opportunity to sleep long, typically they'll bite off a couple of really big nights and then very gradually you know, their sleep requirement comes down. I call it sleep surfing. And you can try it on a holiday when you don't wake up to an alarm and then just see gradually, like you'll, you'll find that your waking time stabilizes and you'll probably wake up around about somewhere between seven and eight hours of sleep and feel really good for that. Um, we don't really know otherwise the, the answer to that question. We know that people tend to be uh, more uh, sick and unwell and have more chronic disease if they sleep more than 12 hours a night. We don't know whether it's the extra sleep or too much sleep causing the disease or if it's the disease causing people to have more sleep. Is it the chicken or the egg? Is it the horse or the cart? We don't know. Yeah. Do people still use progressive muscle relaxation to fall asleep? Absolutely. And I often um, talk to athletes about progressive muscle relaxation or PM, PMR. An example of that is if you take your hand and you make a fist, if you just, if you do it now, if you just squeeze your fist like really, really hard and like keep squeezing it, like keep squeezing it and you can feel your forearm like getting really, really tight, like keep squeezing, keep squeezing it. And now just relax your fist. And it kind of, it, it's just this really weird feeling, like just this intense feeling of relaxation and almost kind of floating. And I feel like my arm wants to float to the ceiling. So you can actually work through all your muscle groups in your body head to toe. It's extremely relaxing. It's extremely effective. Um, yeah, Google that PMR, progressive muscle relaxation, really good little trick. Um, in between competitions, between two and four hours break in between, is it good for the competitor to take a nap? Yeah, so again, it really comes back to whether that's a practiced habit or not. If they generally are not a napper, I would say no, don't do that. If generally they love sleep, they love a nap, it's routine and regular for them to have a to have a 30 minute sleep, uh, you know, mid afternoon, um, and they're used to doing that in between trainings, then yes, um, you know, that's practiced and, and they have faith in that and their brain is used to that. 
right? So, um, you know, as I said, Usain Bolt regularly napped before breaking world records because he practiced that. Um, it really worked for him. I've seen the opposite occur. I've seen people um, nap when they're not used to napping uh, in team sports. Um, I think about All Black Sevens. One young man was asleep, um, <laughs> like right up to kick off just about, and, um, and he really didn't have a good game at all. So, yeah, I've seen the opposite occur as well. If athletes have difficulty sleeping, um, do taking sleeping pills help them? Are sleeping pills actually all right? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, we don't sleep uh, the same when we take sleeping pills. It knocks out different parts of our sleep cycle. Some researchers found that it disturbs us deep sleep. Other researchers found that it disturbs our REM sleep. Some of them are addictive um, and, and really they're just kind of masking, uh, you know, a, a deeper issue, I suppose. Consider them a break glass in case of emergency. You know, if somebody's in psychological distress, um, you know, um, if they have extreme anxiety, if uh, depressed, you know, they might need some medical intervention uh, for a little while to help them through that. And it should be guided and it should be monitored and supervised, but certainly not a long-term solution. Um, yeah, it can actually be really detrimental to the brain long-term. Shorter sleep will reduce their lifespan. The quick answer to that is yes. Um, research is very, very clear that people live a shorter life with less sleep. Um, and, uh, and one of the unfortunate consequences of less sleep is uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, you know, Robert, Robert Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, the, the US president, and, uh, and Margaret Thatcher as well, the Iron Lady, the, um, the Prime Minister of uh, England. Both of them were about four hour sleepers. They both swore that they only needed four hours and they both wound up with Alzheimer's and dementia and died very, very young or much younger than they should have. Um, that saying that we, can, uh, that we can sleep when we're dead, unfortunately, is very, very accurate. Um, can you oversleep like sleep too much? Um, you can. I mean, the main thing that happens is that people jet lag themselves by sleeping in. So, you know, if you're normally a, a 7 a.m. person, you normally wake up at 7 a.m. And then on a Sunday, you wake up at 10. You might feel a little groggy. You might feel a little foggy in the head, maybe have a little headache. What you've done is you've, you've, uh, you've flown into Brisbane, right? You've created almost like a, like a, like a jet lag effect. We actually call it social jet lag and teenagers suffer from this a lot. They, uh, they have very short amounts of sleep Monday through Friday and then they hit the weekend and they sleep binge to try and catch up to dissolve sleep debt. They kind of oversleep, I suppose. Um, uh, it happens with uh, adults as well. It's called social jet lag. And then of course you get to Monday and suddenly you spent two days sleeping in and then come Monday, you've got to wake up early again. It's a bit of a shock to the brain. Um, so, you know, what's the right answer to that? We've got to let young people sleep somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, in the camp that's, that's favorable for letting them sleep in. Yes, they get a little social jet lag, but they need to get their sleep for their, uh, for their little brains and developing brains and developing bodies. They need to get it somewhere. What would be the best timing to stop training before a sleep or a nap? Um, generally, we would regard two or three hours opportunity just to cool the body, wind down, you know, change gears mentally, you know, have a shower, have a meal. Um, I think that's good. It's not always easy in Singapore. Some of my athletes finish training at 10 p.m., you know, and then they travel home and then they have a meal and they get to bed at 1 a.m. Really not ideal. Late sleep, uh, will it affect, will it affect uh, if sleep on time and sleep early? Oh, I'll make you taller. Right, okay. Um, well, I mean, as I said, you know, 90% of bone growth um, happens during sleep. Uh, if somebody's chronically sleep deprived, Potentially, yeah, they could uh, could not fully uh, grow and develop. Um, since all athletes physically different, do some athletes need only just eight hours compared to those that need ten? The answer is yes. Um, again, sleep is very individual, uh, and somebody might just feel a, a million dollars on eight hours of sleep, and that's great, um, and they're optimized on that. Other people need more, so it's about finding that sweet spot for everybody. But in general, more is better than less. Any other methods you can use apart from sleeping pills if you experience bad insomnia from intensive training? Yeah, I mean, um, that idea of relax, relaxing, um, uh, you know, changing gears mentally, uh, meditation, mindfulness, um, you know, it's very individual, isn't it? But there's some wonderful apps out there. Headspace is a really good one if you look that up. Uh, Calm is another really good one. Um, it might be about, um, you know, skin warming and having a hot shower. That definitely works. Um, temperature, making the room nice and cool. Uh, wearing socks makes people drowsy. It's that skin warming thing. 
And several university studies have interestingly found that if you put warm socks on your feet at night, um, it, uh, it makes you sleepier. Really interesting, eh? Um, and then we can ma manipulate that a little bit as well with food. So we know that um, tryptophan, melatonin-rich foods like tart cherries or sour cherries, um, serotonin-rich foods like kiwi. Um, study found that eating two kiwi one hour before bed improves sleep quality by 13%. Um, having some, uh, some carbohydrate in your meal about four hours before bed seems very beneficial as well. Um, um, yeah, and, uh, and, and I guess, you know, if somebody can't sleep, um, the worst thing they could do is kind of stay in bed and toss and turn and just get really frustrated. The worst thing they could do is actually look at their phone and look at the clock um, because then they, they get all this anxiety and frustration that we can't fall asleep. So um, we call that clock watching. Um, don't do it. Um, ask uh, ask your athletes to put their at least their alarm clock um, or their phone like away from um, arm's distance. That'll probably totally freak them out. <laughs> I can't do that. But anyway, um, don't look at the phone at night. Don't look at the clock. Um, and get up if you can't fall asleep within about twenty minutes. Just get up. Keep the lights down. Maybe make a warm drink. Um, you know, maybe read a book under a soft light. Maybe listen to some music. Um, you know, maybe go and have a, a nice warm shower again um, and a little bit of skin warming and then kind of you kind of reset and kind of go back. And if all, all of that fails, just uh, just know that the human body and brain, like we're, we're a survival machine, like we're designed to actually, um, you know, get through uh, a little bit of sleep deprivation and, and um, you know what, we're, we're, we're in survival mode, we're not in thrive mode. And my job is to put athletes um, uh, into help them thrive, not just survive. But, you know, if you have a rough night, survive you well and you'll be OK. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you'll build up that sleep pressure, no doubt. And then the next night you'll probably have a really, really good sleep. Or you could maybe program a nap or a beautiful nap um, that afternoon. If it becomes a chronic issue for you, yeah, definitely go and see your doctor and have a chat. Um, and, and uh, you know, just dig a little bit deeper. There might be something else going on there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's okay. And um, we all experience that, myself included, from time to time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the, the, um, yeah, Elise, thanks for sharing there. Um, you feel free to, um, to drop me an email um, as well if, uh, if you just want to catch up a little bit more. Um, yeah, try the shower and try the socks. Um, try the, you've got the temperature there. Um, try the, the progressive muscle relaxation. I'll just leave you with one last little trick because I better stop talking. Um, uh, is that um, in World War II, um, fighter pilots got very anxious before combat. Um, they couldn't sleep. You know, they pro might die the next day. Quite tough. And um, and they brought in a teacher actually to to work with the um, fighter pilots, and he taught them a way of falling asleep. And it became so effective that um, the pilots were able to fall asleep within two minutes. And what they did was they, um, they encouraged them to lie down and close their eyes and, uh, and, and visualize themselves uh, floating in a boat. So maybe you're floating like an ice canoe or something like that. And you can kind of just visualize, you know, that gentle rocking. Um, rocking is very, very effective. It probably comes back to when we're in the womb and mum's walking around and we're kind of moving around a little bit. A little bit of movement at night seems to be very... Um, very calming and very relaxing and it seems to improve sleep quality. Um, and then, and then they asked them to visualize a big fluffy cloud in a blue sky uh, and, and just visualize that, um, that cloud kind of floating across the sky. The most important advice though, to this technique was to actually ask people to actively relax all of the muscles around their eye socket. So when you're stressed, like you'll probably find that you're squinting a little bit and that's just a subconscious signal to your brain that you're, that something's not quite right, that you're a little bit anxious. So, so first you've, you've really got to just actively relax all of the muscles around your eye. That's reassuring to the brain, hey, I'm actually okay. And then you go into that little visualization, visualization exercise, I'm in a boat, I'm rocking on a nice calm lake, blue sky, fluffy cloud floating across the top. You can try that for a few times, but um, for me, nine out of 10 times it works. And, um, and, it, and it worked uh, really, really well in World War II for the fighter pilots. So you could try that too, perhaps at least. Yeah, so there we are. I better stop talking. Um, thanks so much for joining me. And uh, I really look forward to catching up with you again later in the year where I'll have um, some different content and we'll, we'll, um, 
want to expand upon the the story that is drugs Z Z. Have a great day, guys, and um, and and take care of yourselves. All the best. Um, looking forward to seeing you all a little bit more as we you know get back on track 2021. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Rico. So uh, I will take over the sharing of the screen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for answering all those questions. No problem. That was really good. Yeah. Thanks for all the questions. It was okay, great. Yeah. Okay.